Okay, so this video is going to be on RC circuits and RC analysis. So RC circuits are named that way because they con contain a resistor um, and a capacitor in the same circuit. So I'm going to go through these circuits and sort of um, the, the major equations that are used in these circuits, in the analysis of these circuits. Um, and I'll go through all of this stuff first in DC, which will obviously be in more detail. And then in AC, I'll sort of touch upon it. Um, but obviously, the AC analysis is much more involved, so I won't go into as much detail as I do with DC. So for DC, um, let me just draw this first. So let's draw an, a simple RC circuit. So you have a capacitor here, a capacitance C. You have a resistor of resistance R, and then you have some sort of potential source. You know, you can have a battery, whatever. We'll just call it an EMF device, right? So EMF device, which will sort of provide an external potential for this um, for the circuit. Now we need to consider these RC circuits in DC. So let me just write DC. We want to consider these RC circuits in DC uh, in sort of two separate scenario. So the first scenario um, is is the charging scenario, right? So this is when the capacitor has no initial charge on it and we are charging it up. The other scenario, which is opposite, is the discharging scenario. So in that case, the capacitor already has a full charge or some, some charge on it and we are discharging the capacitor. So it's, it's releasing um, current or it's releasing energy into this circuit. So starting off with a charging case, this is when you need that battery or whatever EMF source to charge up this capacitor. So in this case, um, we start off, in both of the cases actually, we start off with Kirchhoff's voltage law, right? So we want to write the loop law, the, the Kirchhoff loop law for this um, system, which is that the voltage gain equals the voltage drop. So there's no net change in voltage if you start at one point and come back to the same point. So we, we have V, which is the potential of this source, minus IR, which is from Ohm's law, which is the voltage uh, drop across the resistor, and then minus uh, Q over C, which is coming from the relation Q equals CV for a capacitor, right? So the voltage drop across the capacitor uh, is equal to Q over C. So all of this is equal to zero. This is Kirchhoff's loop law, basic stuff. Now we want to convert this into some sort of uh, ordinary differential equation, right? So we want to exploit the fact that the i and the q are related by a differential, uh, by, by a derivative, right? Because i equals dq dt. So v minus r dq dt minus q over c equals zero. Uh, and now we'll isolate this r dq dt so we get V minus Q over C equals R D Q D T. And now we want to have common differentials, right? So on the Q, we, we need the differential D Q uh, in order to integrate it properly. So we, we move uh, this V minus Q over C on the right side in division, right? So we have uh, one over V minus Q over C D Q. And on the other side, we have one over R uh, dt. So this is essentially the thing that we're, the expression that we want to integrate on both sides. On the left, we integrate 0 to t, and on, uh, on the right, we integrate qi to qt. So let's, let's do this integration. So on the left, uh, r is a constant, right? So we just get 1 over r times t. And this equals on, on the right side, you can do a mental substitution. So you get negative C and then this thing becomes a logarithm. Uh, so you get ln V minus Q T uh, over C over V minus Q I over C. And so we want to move this C uh, over to the, to the other side. So we just, let's just divide both sides by negative C. So we get negative T over RC equals ln v minus qt over c over v minus qi over c. And this should make us happy because we have this over here, right? We have rc, which is the, which is the time constant. So something's working out properly, so that's good. So let's, let's move this arrow to the other side. Uh, and now we want to simplify 
um, the argument of this of this natural logarithm. So notice that the initial charge when you're charging is zero, right? Because you start off at zero charge. So qi equals zero. So we have negative t over rc equals the natural logarithm of v minus qt over c over v. And now we multiply uh, the numerator denominator um, in the in the logarithm by c. So negative t over rc equals the, the natural log of uh, cv minus qt over cv. Now notice another thing. When the circuit is fully charged up, uh, basically when there's no more current flowing through it, then the, the voltage across the capacitor has to be the same as the voltage across the battery, right? So Vc equals V, where V is the voltage across the battery. So in that case, um, remember that Q equals Cv, right? So the Cv over here is, uh, it's, it's a Cvc over here, but these two are the same, so it's equal to Cv. So the Cv over here is just the final charge, right? When the capacitor is fully charged up, it has a charge equal to Cv. So we can replace that in there because uh, so the negative r over uh, negative t over rc equals the natural log uh, of Cv, which is just Qf minus Qt over Qf. And now we take the uh, Euler exponential on both sides, so we get e to the negative. Um, sorry, the, we take that the e power on both sides, so we get e to the negative t over rc equals the the ln cancels with the e, so we get Qf minus Qt over Qf. Now we just solve for Qt using you know, normal uh, algebra, so we get Qf uh, times one minus e to the negative t over rc. Uh, and now we want to see if the solution sort of, you know, physically makes sense for us. So we want to check some extreme cases, um, sort of boundary cases, and see if this solution indeed makes any sort of physical sense, right? Because at the end, we need to make sure that our work so far is reasonable. So so let's do that. So let's, let's try t equals zero first, right? So t equals zero is the initial state. Qt equals qf. And this e, e function tends to, uh, becomes e to the zero, which is just one, so we get one minus one. So then qt equals q, uh, qf. So this is sort of the relation that we get um, when, when t tends to zero. Oh, sorry, sorry, what am I doing? qt equals zero. So this is the relation that we get when t becomes zero. Um, and again, this is something that we expect, right? Because when the time is zero, right? When you just started charging this thing, the capacitor is obviously not going to have any car, uh, have any charge on it because you haven't charged it yet, right? So QT has to be zero when T equals zero. The second case that we want to do is when T tends to infinity. So when T tends to infinity, this is when you've more or less fully charged this capacitor, right? So when that happens, then QT equals QF times one minus this e function becomes an e to the negative infinity, which tends to zero. So qt tends to qf. And again, this is what we expect, right? Because qf is the final um, charge when everything is fully charged up. And when you'd let time tend to infinity, that's, you know, essentially your capacitor is becoming closer and closer to that fully charged uh, state. And it's gonna approach that asymptotically. So that's exactly what we expect. Let's erase all this stuff. And then we move on to the case where we're discharging this capacitor, which is also in DC. So discharging, and this is gonna be um, slightly easier than the previous uh, charging case because we don't need to do any sort of substitution in our integral. So when you're discharging, we don't even need a battery right now, right, because um, the, cap the capacitor already has charge on it, so it can just power this entire circuit. So we have the circuit uh, capacitor with capacitance C and resistor, resistor with resistance R. Again, we write Kirchhoff's uh, voltage law or Kirchhoff's loop law. So we get um, C, the, the voltage across the capacitor has to equal the voltage across uh, this resistor. So we get uh, Q over C minus IR equals zero, right? So the first relation, the this term comes from Q equals CV, 
and the IR term comes from Ohm's law. So that's pretty standard. Uh, and then we do our derivative uh, substitution again. So we get Q over C equals negative R D DQ DT. Sorry. Equals R DQ DT. And then we move the differentials so that the DQ and the Q are on the same side. So we uh, divide the right side by Q and uh, the left side by R. So we get one over RC uh, times DT equals one over Q DQ. And now we want to integrate this one over RC DT. And now we want to integrate this uh, from some initial state to some final state, right? So we, we go from the fully charged state, which is uh, going to be at ti and then we go to tf and on the on the right hand side we go from uh, qi or yeah sorry qi um, and then we go to some q at time t so we want to integrate this now notice that qi and qt they're not like because the 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 initial charge is larger than the final charge when you're discharging, right? Because you start off with a lot of charge and you end with not as much charge. So in this case, this right-hand integral has a larger limit at the bottom and a smaller limit at the top, right? So you can't integrate with this normal dq. You have to use a slightly different version, version um, because you need... So let me just draw this out. So let's say you have um, some qi and then you have qi plus dq then this qi plus dq is smaller than qi because the capacitor is losing charge right so we have to account for that so this dq we can just straight up integrate this we have to put a minus sign in front of here because this dq remember was negative dq dt was negative so dq was negative and so before we integrate this we have to put that negative sign in front or else the integral uh, will turn out wrong so now let's integrate this. So we get 1 over RC times T. And let me just set this initial time to 0. So we get times T equals, and on this side we get a negative, and we get the natural log um, of QT over QI. So now this negative, we can move it to the left. So we get negative T over RC equals the natural log of QT over QI. And then we take the E power on both sides. So we take e to the negative t over rc equals, and on the right side, the e cancels with the logarithm, so we get qt over qi. And then qt is simply qi times e to the negative t over rc, and we're done. So let's again check if this solution makes any sort of um, physical sense, right? So we want to see if we plug in extreme values like we did last time, we get reasonable, physically reasonable um, results. So let's do that. So uh, let's plug in t equals zero to start off with. So then q of t, or just q of zero, q of zero equals qi, which is also just q of zero, uh, times e to the power negative t over rc, which is just zero. So this thing becomes one and it all works out, right? The left hand becomes, the, the left hand side is equal to the right hand side. So that's exactly what we, we would expect. Let's try the infinity case. So when t tends to infinity, then qt uh, equals qi times e to the power negative infinity, which is gonna tend to zero. So qt tends to zero, right? Because the right hand side tends to zero. And this is again what we expect, right? Because when you fully discharge this thing or when you discharge it for long enough, then the charge will obviously decay off um, and, and eventually hit zero, and it's an exponential decay. So that's all good. So, and one more thing that I want to go through is um, this charging and discharging functions, we wrote them down for Q, right? So we, we wrote them down for Q of T, uh, which is the charge on the capacitor, right? So for charging uh, and for discharging, we wrote, for discharging, we wrote Q of T equals qi times e power negative t over rc. Uh, and similarly for, for the charging case, we wrote um, qt equals qi times one minus e to the negative t over rc. Uh, sorry, qf. Uh, 
So this is what we wrote over here. Now, these functions on their own, they only tell you the charge, right, across the capacitor. But that doesn't mean that you can't find the other circuit sort of parameters that you need to find, right, like current, voltage, um, etc. In fact, you can find them quite easily once you know these equations. And the reason why is because remember that i is just dq dt, right? So you can just differentiate these things and find the current. And you can find the voltage across the resistor and things like that using Ohm's law. And so although these equations themselves are only telling you the current, it's very, very simple to just go from current to voltage or, uh, across the resistor, for example, uh, or go from you know charge to voltage across the capacitor or interchange between these quantities once you know the charge across the capacitor. And that's an important thing. So you don't need to write these, you don't need to derive these equations for current and, and voltage and everything separately. You can just find these two that I've um, derived here for, for the charge. And from here, you can go to other parameters using um, sort of elementary relationships between charge, current, uh, and voltage. So that's something to keep in mind here. Um, just as an example, for example, if I, if I wanted to find uh, I of T, then I can just differentiate, right? So at, at the time t, um, and, and then just solve using this relatively simple derivative. And so that's essentially um, sort, of, sort of the point here, that you only need charge to find these other parameters. Now, the next thing that I wanna go through is the AC. Um, so the DC stuff is basically done. So I'm gonna go through the AC uh, sort of version of this. And the AC version, as I said, is more involved. So I'll go through the major formulas and things like that, but uh, I won't really, I'll present them without proof, basically. Um, the proofs are available online, I'm sure, but they are quite involved. So let's just go through the key results that you can actually use um, in in applications without having to go through all, all the math. So for AC analysis, one of the one of the important things is that you have to switch to complex variables. You have to you have to use complex variables when you're um, analyzing these things in our uh, in AC, and that sometimes complicates things slightly because you know complex things are when you use them in, in a physics type situation they're sometimes hard to link to the physical world right because complex numbers don't necessarily correspond to to things in our daily experience. But anyways, if we just you know do the algebra and and find these equations, then they work out pretty pretty well. So let's draw a circuit, right? So in AC, generally these circuits are set up differently. So one example of an RC circuit in in, in, in an AC um, situation would be as follows. So you would have your resistor, uh, and then your capacitor, and the, the resistance is R, and uh, the capacitance is C. And then you would have two other sort of open leads over here. So what's going on with these open leads, right? So basically across this, you apply some potential V in. And this entire apparatus over here, right, that I've drawn, will map, will sort of tr transform this V in into an output signal, which is VC, because it's just a voltage across the capacitor, right? So this is equal to V out. And you can also do the same thing um, across the resistor, right? So for example, let me just draw this. The resistor also has VR as its potential across it. So this takes this this entire setup takes this input signal over here and maps it to these VR and VC um, signals. Now two things can change when you do these, right? So for an AC signal, you have let's say we draw an AC signal. For for a DC signal, you only have like your, your I guess, amplitude, right? You, you only have a voltage. But for an AC signal, you not only have your voltage, which is your amplitude, but you also have a phase because this wave is distinct from this wave, even though they have the same amplitude. And and so there's a phase shift. And, the, and those are the sort of two things that you need to consider. Now, it turns out that if you use complex numbers to deal with this, it becomes relatively um, easy to visualize because complex numbers, they have a magnitude, which is going to be your amplitude. And they also have a theta, right? So if you map a complex number on the complex, uh, on the complex plane, then it has a magnitude, right? So the mod of Z, 
and it has a data. And so this data you can sort of visualize as being your phase and the mod will be your scalar voltage or your amplitude. So let's go through some of the some of the major equations. Now, this apparatus, as I said, is transferring um, one voltage that you put in into another type of voltage. So it's called the, the function that tells you that the relationship between these voltages is called a transfer function. So transfer function. And it's generally denoted uh, uh, with a capital H, so transfer function um, H. And we have one for the capacitor and one for the resistor, right? So for the capacitor case, we have H sub C. And this transfer function is representing the ratio between the, uh, between the capacitor voltage uh, and the input voltage. So this equals Vc over Vn. Now, I I'll present this without proof right now, but the, the equation for this is 1 over 1 plus Rc times S, which is a parameter. And the parameter S is equal to the complex frequency of this input signal, right? So S equals um, some I times omega plus a sigma. And the sigma is the real component, uh, which is the exponential decay component. And this is the angular frequency 2 pi f. And the i is root negative 1, but in circuits, we don't want to confuse it with current, so I'll call that j. So this is what we end up with. Now, the, the good thing about this is if you have a sinusoidal input um, potential, right? So if your potential is perfectly sinusoidal, right? So it doesn't decay at all. So, so by contrast, the decaying potential would be something like this, right? Where the, the amplitude gets smaller. But if you don't have that, right, which you generally don't, if you just have a sinusoidal potential, then your sigma, which is your exponential decay factor, component, whatever, will tend to zero, right? So it's equal to zero for uh, a sine wave input. And that simplifies calculations by a lot, right? So that, that's a good thing. So in that case, S equals uh, just J omega. Now, we want to write another transfer function, right? But this time for the capacitor, uh, for the resistor. So for the resistor, uh, we have H sub R. And this equals VR over VN. And this, again, I'm presenting it without proof, is RC times the same parameter S over 1 plus RC uh, times the parameter S. So these are um, these are the functions. Now notice that both of these functions are complex, uh, com are going to give you complex ratios or complex numbers as the ratio. And the reason why they give you a complex number is because they not only tell you the ratio of the, of the, of the scalar voltages, but they also tell you the phase shift between these voltages. So they tell you, they encode these two pieces of information in the same ratio, which is a pretty neat thing. So we want to sort of break these ratios down into the scalar component uh, and, and the phase shift component, right? So we want to know how much the scalar voltage or the amplitude of the voltage differs by um, between the input and the output. But we also want to know what the phase differs by. So we want to break these two um, transfer functions down. So let's do that right now. So let me just erase this, make up, make some space. So the first one, which is the scalar, which is, you can say the amplitude of the scalar voltage, uh, that's called the gain, right? So the ratio of the scalar voltages uh, is called the gain. So let's say you have a wave like this and you have another wave um, like this with the same amplitude, but a phase shift then the gain is just one because we don't care about the phase shift for the gain. We just care about how much the amplitude, how much, what the ratio of the amplitudes are. In this case, it's just one. So for the gain, we only want to take the real component. Um, sorry, we don't want, we want to take the mod uh, of these, of these transfer functions, right? We, we want to find the magnitude of these transfer functions. Now, if you remember from um, normal, you know, complex algebra, it's relatively simple to find the magnitude of a complex number, right? So let's do that right now. So let's do, the, for the, for, do it for the capacitor first. So the mod of HC equals one over one plus RC. 
And S, remember, we had a sinusoidal input, right? So we just have J times omega. You don't care about the sigma. And to find the mod of this complex number, you just, you know, you multiply by the complex conjugate and then you, you take the root, right? So the mod of this, so, and this is going to be equal um, to, you do, uh, you, you keep the mod signs. And if you do some rearrangement with this, first you want to express this uh, entire ratio as, as a complex number without the complex component at the bottom, right? So let's do that first. So let me just erase this, actually. Let's multiply both sides by the complex conjugate, right? So hc equals 1 minus uh, jrc omega over 1 plus rc omega squared, right? So, and, th and this is equal to 1 over 1 plus rc omega squared minus uh, j times rc omega over 1 plus rc omega squared, right? So this is another way to express this. Now, to find the mod, you would take hc and multiply it by the complex conjugate of hc, and then you would root that, right? So if you do that for, for this case, um, you know, do some algebra and it works out. And the result that you get, I'll just write it out, um, is 1 over the square root of 1 plus omega rc all squared. That's what you get. And this is essentially just telling you the mod um, of, of this transfer function. So basically the ratio of the amplitudes of the input and the output signal that you're going to get out of this um, rc apparatus that's hooked up in, in an AC circuit. So this is what you get. Now let's do a similar thing um, for the case where we have uh, a resistor, right? So we want to do the same thing for a resistor. So HR, and you take the mod, is equal to RC times J omega over 1 plus RC times J omega. And again, you can work out algebra, right? You can convert this into um, a standard form and then, and then find the mod. And you would get omega RC over the square root of 1 plus omega RC squared. So this, this is what you end up getting. Now, these two are the scalar sort of multiples or scalar ratios between the voltages, right? So, and you can confirm that they are indeed scalars because there's no complex component um, on, on any of these. So now the next thing that we want to deal with is the phase shift, right? So we found the scalar ratios, but we also want to find the phase shift between this input and output um, frequencies. So this was the gain. The next thing that we want to do is, is the phase shift. So let me erase all this. So the phase shift, or the phase angle, it's called phase shift psi. And the psi, we do it for the capacitor first, and then for the, res for the resistor. So the psi is, you want to find the angle of this ratio, right? You want to, for the gain, we found the magnitude. For, for the phase shift, you want to find the angle. So let's do that. So let's write this thing in, comp in uh, standard form, right? So we did that before, but I'll just do it again. So hc equals 1 over 1 plus rc s, and s is just j omega. So multiply by the complex conjugate on the top and bottom. So we get 1 minus rc into j omega over 1 plus rc omega squared. So that's what we get. And we want to break this down into real and complex components. So we get 1 over 1 plus rc omega squared minus j into rc omega over 1 plus rc omega squared. And to find the angle, you just take the arctan, right? So we get arctan of the component, right? So we get negative um, rc omega, and then we divide that by 1, right? So we get get R10 of just negative RC omega, right? So this is the phase shift um, for, for the capacitor between the voltages.
Now we want to find the phase shift also for the resistor, right? So let's do the same proce uh, procedure for the resistor. So HR equals RC times J omega over one plus RC times J omega. Let's convert this to standard form again. Um, so we multiply by the complex conjugate. So we get RC times J omega times one minus RC times J omega over one plus RC omega squared. And then we multiply this out, right? So we get RC times J omega uh, minus RC omega squared and the J squares give you a negative one. So that becomes a plus one over one plus RC omega squared. And now if we take the, the ratios, right? So we get um, psi sub R equals arc 10 of the complex component um, over the real component. So the complex component in this case is RC times omega, and we divide by RC omega squared. And you can cancel off the squares, so we get arc 10 of one over RC omega. So let me just highlight these. So the phase shift for the capacitor is this, and the phase shift for the resistor is that. So these are the these are two important results that you can find using simple um, complex algebra. So let me just erase this. And so if you were to draw these things, right? So let's say you do it for the capacitor, um, for the for the input versus the capacitor. Then let's say your input was in red, you might have something like this. And let's say your capacitor was in blue, you might get something that's phase shifted and shifted in its, uh, sorry, let me just erase that. So you might get something that's phase shifted and shifted in its amplitude at the same time, right? You might get something like that. So you have uh, your, your phase shift angle psi, which is the psi that you computed over here. And then you have your ratio between your, your scalar voltages um, which is the mod of your transfer function. And this is equal to the gain, which we also computed uh, with, with formulas. So essentially, this is how you, how you can analyze um, an RC circuit in an AC sort of setup, like I drew in the diagram earlier, um, where you have an input voltage and then you're mapping it to some sort of output voltage. So that's basically all that I want to cover for this video. Um, thank you all for watching.